Today we are going to be considering a very important topic. And that topic has to do with our families. The title of our study today is Building Strong Families God's Way. Building Strong Families God's Way. If you have your Bible nearby, I'd like you to find the book of Deuteronomy and turn to chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. God was in the process of fulfilling his plan of building a strong nation. And in order to build a strong nation, he was going to build it with strong homes. As Moses is giving the instruction to the children of Israel and to Joshua, he emphasizes repeatedly the necessity of families that will trust God and families who will obey God's commands and families who will really, really dedicate themselves to living for the Lord. I can't emphasize how very important it is in our day and age for God to fulfill his plan in your family. He wants very, very much to build a strong family in your home. Uh, he wants to build a strong local church. And the way he does it is by building strong individuals and strong families. Now, you'll remember that the first generation of the children of Israel have perished in the wilderness. The first generation arrived at a place we call Kadesh Barnea. The Jewish people would probably refer to it as Kadash Barnea. They arrived at that place in Numbers chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 14. They sent the spies in, and the spies returned, and uh, ten of the spies have a bad report. Only two of the spies have a good report, Joshua and Caleb. The hearts of the people melt. They, in fear, reject God's plan. They say, we're not able to go up. We're not able to take this land. All is lost. Maybe we ought to go back to Egypt. And as a result of that, you remember full well, God said, all right, you are going to perish in the wilderness. You are not going to go into the land. And the first generation, by and large now, has died. They have perished in the wilderness because of their unbelief and the rejection of God's plan. Now we come to the second generation, the younger generation. And here they are. They are in the wilderness, but they are poised, ready to go into that land, into a land they'd never been in before. They're heading in a direction they had never traveled before. They're going to have experiences they've never experienced before. And they are going to have a land that they, in their wildest imaginations, could not imagine the incredible blessing of the land. But now God, through his servant, wants to really emphasize the point and wants the people to really grow and stretch and be committed and be surrendered to building a strong family. And God gives five dynamic principles for us as he did in the lives of the children of Israel in the Old Testament, he had five things that needed to become very, very important to them. Likewise, if we are going to build strong families today, we must have the exact same five principles. Let me just say, I believe that the family is very important. And I believe that God wants to build strong families. But I want you to understand the blessings of a strong family, the blessings of being a biblical family. A biblical family 
uh, provides several things. And I'm going to get us to Deuteronomy chapter 8 in just a moment. But I want us to understand clearly what a biblical family is, what a strong family is all about. Whatever the family picture in your home might be is what God wants to build and make stronger. Perhaps I'm speaking to daddies and mommies with children from that one union. Perhaps I'm speaking to daddies and mommies who have had a previous marriage and you now have children from those previous marriages all residing under one roof. Or perhaps I'm speaking to a single daddy who is raising his children. Or perhaps I'm speaking to a single mommy who is raising her children. Perhaps I'm speaking to grandparents who have custody of their grandchildren and you are raising your grandchildren. Bless your hearts. God bless you, Grandma. God bless you, Grandpa. God give you strength beyond your years. One of the things that I am finding as I travel back and forth across America and preach in many different states in our churches across America is I'm meeting almost every single weekend, almost every single weekend, I'm meeting grandparents who have custody of their children, some grandparents who have even officially, legally adopted their grandchildren and are raising them for Christ. God bless you, Grandma. God bless you, Grandpa. I know that you could be taking it easy these days, but you are committed to doing what God has asked you to do, and you are committed to your grandchildren. God, God bless you. Whatever the picture in your home God wants your home to provide the following things. First, it must be a place of safety. It's a place where no one is intentionally harmed. That does not mean that we never say no to our children. That does not mean that we do not discipline our children. But we do not wound our children. We do not wound them physically. We do not wound them emotionally. We do not wound them sexually. A biblical home, a, a strong, growing home, is a place of safety. It is a place, secondly, of security and of support. I am accepted the way God has made me. And I am appreciated for the person I am becoming. I have not arrived yet. I certainly am far from perfect. But I am accepted and I am appreciated for the person I am becoming. Thirdly, it's a place of individuality. There is no one just like me. My brothers or my sisters, even my parents, I have some very real differences that make me just uniquely my own individual person. I have individual opportunities. I have individual strengths. I have individual weaknesses. I have individual challenges. It's a place where everyone recognizes that we are all very much an individual. It is, fourthly, a place where I learn my sense of worth. It is a place where I learn my sense of worth. I, in myself, am not that object of worth. However, as a Christian, as a Christian, I can discover God's purpose for me, and as his workmen created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, Ephesians 2.10, I find my true sense of worth. My true sense of worth rests in the fact that I am unconditionally loved for who I am as I am discovering the plan and the purpose of God. And by His grace, through faith, I have been saved as I have accepted His gift. It's not of my good works, lest I should boast, but it's understanding I am His workmanship. 
created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that I should walk in them. That is my sense of worth, discovering God's purpose. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And next, number five, it is a place where I learn from my mistakes. It is a place where I learn from my mistakes. My mistakes are not continually brought up before me, but I'm learning from my mistakes where my family helps me to do better the next time. Number six, it's a place of fun. It's a place of shared joys. It's a place where happy memories are made. And number seven, it's a place to grow. It's a place to grow. There, I learn about relationships. I learn how to receive love, and I learn how to give love. I learn how to be a lovable person, and I learn how to be a loving person. That's the blessing of being a biblical home and a biblical family. And that's what God wanted to do in the lives of the children of Israel. He wanted them to love him. He wanted them to follow him. They wanted, he wanted very, very much for them to be fully surrendered and fully trusting and fully obedient and, and, and in full fellowship, enjoying the privilege of walking by faith with God. And as a result of that, he tells them five things. There are five things that families that are being built God's way must always remember. Number one, to please the Lord, families that are growing stronger must observe the will of God. The key word will be the word observe. To please the Lord, families must observe the will of God. The will of God. Chapter 8 and verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. Isn't that interesting? God says, all the commands which I command thee this day shall you observe to do. This has to do with the will of God. God has communicated to us his will. He has shared with us what he wants us to know, what he wants us to do, what he wants us to become. God has shared his will, and now we must observe it. This word observe is an interesting word. It has to do with guarding, of being on guard duty and being alert because you're on guard duty. It has to do with keeping. It has to do with paying attention to. Uh, this illustration is really going to date me, I know. But when I was a little boy growing up in western New York, I began my lifelong love of trains. There was a, there was a siding. There was a, a siding back in one of the communities where my parents uh, would often get groceries on Friday night. I know this is going to date me, but there was a place where as I grew older, I would go down to the guard shack at the railroad crossing. And there was an older man there. For the life of me, I cannot remember his name. I have tried for a long time to remember it. That's gone. But I remember distinctly standing in the little guard shack, and he would have posted on the wall the time that the trains would be coming by. And uh, he still ran manually the gate. Uh, it was be just before the uh, regular uh, mechanical gates were installed and the red flashing lights were installed. It was in the very final years where the gatekeepers would stand guard. And he would uh, check the time for the next train. And in between times, he would tell me some of the wonderful stories 
uh, back when he used to work on the big freight engines and the, and the trains. And I loved to listen to his stories. But then something interesting would happen. Uh, he'd pull out his watch and he'd open the watch and check the time. And then he would say to me, now, boy, I can't talk for a few minutes and you'll have to be very quiet. And he would turn and he would stare down the track. And I, of course, would be watching because I knew that meant a train was coming. And I loved trains. And there was nothing like being in the regular guard shack when that freight train roared by. You could just feel the, the uh, earth shake and so loved trains. And he would stare down the track. And I would watch and see absolutely nothing and would just stare and stare and watch and observe and pay attention to. And sooner or later a little tiny speck of light would come and it'd grow bigger and grow bigger and grow bigger and he'd go out and pull the gate down and stand guard and stop traffic and the train would thunder through and he'd pull the gate back up and we would resume conversation. That is exactly this word in the Hebrew, observe. It is to be watching for. It is to be paying attention to. It is because I am on guard duty. I must be alert. And that is exactly what we must be concerning the will of God. In our homes, in our families, are we ever alert? Are we ever paying attention to? Are we ever observing the way God leads us and directs us and works out situations and works out timing and brings little blessings and brings great joys? We need to be alert to observe the will of God. The psalmist prayed in Psalm 143 and verse 10, Teach me to do thy will, O my God. We need God to teach us to do his will, to be observant to his will. Wise families observe the will of God. I want to encourage families all across America that are joining in this workshop today. There is no improvement on the will of God. Former state representative of the Empire State Fellowship of regular Baptist churches, old Dr. Russell Camp, often would say to the preacher boys, men, there is no improvement on the will of God. Are you here by the will of God? Then you can't improve on that. Until God takes you to your next place, there is no improvement in the will of God. The question is today, families, do you know the will of God? Have you sought the will of God? Are you seeking to observe the will of God? Number one, to please the Lord, families must observe the will of God. Secondly, to please the Lord, families must remember the worthiness of God. Families must remember the worthiness of God. If we're going to be building strong families, we must do it God's way. And when we do it God's way, it pleases him. And to please the Lord we must remember the worthiness of God. Chapter 8, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Listen to that again. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. What a powerful statement. As a matter of fact, right here in Deuteronomy, right in this section, God gives us four things that we need to remember. God gives us four wonderful, wonderful things that we need to remember. We need to remember, first of all, the grace of God. We need to remember the grace of God, chapter 5 and verse 15. Remember you were a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, 
Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. God wants us to remember his marvelous grace. It was not that you were so big and impressive and important. You were only a servant in Egypt, but I brought you out. Uh, the Lord brought you out through a mighty hand and a stretched out arm. That is grace. Remember the grace of God. Remember, secondly, the greatness of God. The greatness of God. Chapter 7 and verse 18. Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but shall well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and unto all Egypt. Yeah, you know, the second generation of the children of Israel were poised in the wilderness, ready to go into the land. And there would be many great battles there. There would be huge, incredible battles. It was not going to be easy, but they could well do it because God was leading them. And God is great, and God is powerful. And they needed to remember what God did in the land of Egypt. The ten plagues all struck at the very heart of ten Egyptian deities, of ten mighty Egyptian deities. And over and over and over again, the true and the living God defeated every false god and defeated the army of Pharaoh, the very most powerful and elite of the soldiers. And they needed to remember the greatness of God. Are you facing a battle today? Please remember, battles are nothing new to the Lord. And he is the great overcomer. He is the Lord mighty in battle, Psalm 24. He is the Lord of tremendous greatness. And we need to remember it. Thirdly, we need to remember the guidance of God. We need to remember the guidance of God. Chapter 8 and verse 2. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or no. God says, remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee in the wilderness these 40 years. If you're looking at chapter 8 and verse 2, I want you to notice how God refers to himself. He refers to himself as the Lord thy God. You are well familiar with this truth, but it's, it's so important to be reminded of. Remember, when you see the word Lord spelled capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, it is God's personal name. It is Yahweh. It is Jehovah. It's found 6,700 times in the Old Testament. It is his personal first name. And it speaks of him being the self-existent one, the self-sufficient one, the incredible self-existent one. And then in the next line, he calls himself thy God. Capital G, small o, small d, is the title of his office. His office is God. Lord is his name. Now the title of his office, God, is spelled E-L-O-H-I-M. It, it looks like it's Elohim, doesn't it? It's actually pronounced Elohim. Elohim. And it's found over 2,300 times in the Old Testament. It, it actually is the majestic one, or the one who puts forth power and majesty. And when we're talking about the guidance of God, 40 years he sustained a nation on the move in the wilderness. That is what Yahweh, Elohim, 
was able to do in his marvelous guidance. If God could guide a nation and sustain them in the wilderness for 40 years, can't God guide and sustain you today? Probably one of the most frequently quoted verses. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Is God not able to guide you? I love Psalm 73. It is a tremendous psalm written by Asaph. And in Psalm 73, in a very wonderful, wonderful verse, verse 24, thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. We need to remember the guidance of God. And we need to ask him to make us sensitive to his guidance. We're remembering the worthiness of God by remembering his grace, remembering his greatness, remembering his guidance. And fourthly, we need to remember his glory. Chapter 9 and verse 7. God says, remember and forget not how you provoked the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you departed out of the land of Egypt, until ye came unto this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. In the glory of God, he was moved to wrath. He is a God of glory. He is an awesome God. He is a holy God. He is a sovereign, majestic, incredible, true, and living God. And don't push him. Don't tempt him. Don't provoke him. Those of us who know him as our personal Lord and Savior, it is a family matter of not wanting to hurt our Father. Those who do not know him in a personal saving way, they are provoking the judge. How very important it is that we remember the worthiness of our God. Thirdly, today, as we're building strong families God's way, we need to be pleasing the Lord by families must know the word of God. Number three, families must know the word of God. Chapter 8 and verse 3. The Bible says, and he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. We need to know the word of God. Look at that phrase right in the middle of verse 3. That he might make thee know, man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Very interesting. As the Lord Jesus began his public ministry, immediately he is driven in Matthew chapter 4, into the deserted place, into the wilderness. And there the Lord Jesus fasts 40 days and 40 nights. He goes without eating. And we believe perhaps drinking. We know that he has not eaten in 40 days. He was on a 40-day fast, as he prayed, as he was intimate 
with God his Father as he invested day after day after day before the Father. Many of us are not at all familiar with missing a single meal. And we know that as the next meal approaches, we are beginning to realize that we're ready to eat again. I perhaps in this workshop am speaking to many pastors. We really do not need a watch in the auditorium, do we, on Sunday mornings. We know when it's approaching noon. We can tell it on the faces of our people, can't we? They are like little alarm clocks all over the auditorium. We would never tell them that, but we preachers can tell as noon is approaching. They can tell it on their faces. But friends, can you imagine what it would be like to go without food for 40 days? The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 4, and we need to check this out. Matthew chapter 4, verses beginning at verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. He not only was fasting for the spiritual purpose of intimate fellowship with the Father, but he was also fasting to demonstrate his overcoming by the use of Scripture on that wicked one, the devil. Verse 3 says, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Isn't it interesting that the Lord Jesus Christ quoted Scripture to demonstrate to us how to be an overcomer. We need to know the word of God. We can never face temptation and be victorious on our own strength and merits. We can never face our spiritual enemies and be victorious consistently on our own strength and merit. We must know the word of God. We must be able to use the word of God. We must be able to apply the word of God. We must be able to take God's word, quote it, use it, and see the victory from God's word. Now, very honestly, friends, think of this. The Lord Jesus has not eaten in 40 days. Satan knew just exactly how to strike, where to strike, when to strike. Jesus, the Bible says, was afterward and hungered. It literally gives the idea of being just absolutely famished, just absolutely craving something to eat. I've had the privilege of being in Israel a number of times. And I want to tell you, in Israel, you will find some of the most delicious bread anywhere on the face of the earth. I've had the privilege of uh, eating bread in a number of foreign countries. And there, there is just no other bread anywhere in the world that tastes like some of the marvelous breads that are prepared in Israel. Satan struck at the very heart of the most trying moment And in the greatest need that Jesus had, the need for bread. But the Lord Jesus did not handle Satan on his own. For our sakes, he quoted Scripture. And guess what? He quoted Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3, right where we are in the text. And Satan lost that round. You'll remember from Matthew chapter 4, there are going to be two more major attacks. 
And again, the Lord Jesus will quote scripture, and Satan loses those attacks. The lesson for us, if we're going to build strong families that please the Lord, then our families must know the word of God. I'm concerned. Our children are spending so much time before television. They're spending so much time on the computer. They're spending so much time in video games. And I'm not here to argue about any of those things. But I am very, very concerned that our children are spending so little time in the Word of God. So little, little time in personal devotions or quiet time, whatever you want to call them. Such little time in family devotions and family worship. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. When it talks about the word of Christ dwelling in us richly, it, it literally gives the idea of being right at home in our lives, of the word of God residing in our life, of, of the word of God operating in our daily lives. There are no shortcuts to success. Mark it down. Instant gratification. Instant gratification leads to spiritual ruin. And the only way to have true, true victory is to know the Word of God. Number four, to please the Lord, families must consider the witness of God. To please the Lord, families must consider the witness of God. And that witness is right here in verse 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. The witness of God is, if you are honestly my children, then I'm going to raise you. And I will invest time and energy and, and devotion to make sure that you are being raised properly. As a good dad disciplines his children because he loves them and he delights in them, so God disciplines us as well. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 8 tells us that if we are really legitimately his children, God will discipline us. If we never experience his discipline, then we need to examine our faith because that demonstrates that we are illegitimate children. Proverbs chapter 3, 11 and 12 teaches us that a good dad delights in his children and therefore biblically disciplines his children. When we talk about God's discipline, it's important to remember it's not just spanking. It's not just a woodshed experience. God's discipline is instructing us and reminding us and training us and encouraging us and correcting us. To please the Lord, we must consider the witness of God. And then lastly, to please the Lord, to be a strong family that's being built God's way. To please the Lord, families must believe the warning of God. Families must believe the warning of God. Chapter 8 and verse 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. God wants to build strong families. Determined to be a strong family by being parents whose chief goal is to please the Lord, your God. Go back to the basics and build line upon line, precept upon precept. Give God the first priority and surrender to his plan. Give your children to the Lord and pray daily for them 
And then remember, to build strong families God's way, families must observe the will of God, chapter 8 and verse 1. Families must remember the worthiness of God, chapter 8 and verse 18. God is worthy of our love and worthy of our devotion and worthy of our worship. We worship him and we are devoted to him and we are blessed by his grace, his greatness, his guidance, and his glory. Families, thirdly, must know the word of God. Families, fourthly, must consider the witness of God. Families, fifthly, must believe the warning of God. And so, may the Lord richly bless the families of the Lord throughout America. Whatever your family picture looks like in your house, may God help you, bless you, and give you strength to day by day, line by line, precept upon precept, be committed and surrendered to building strong families God's way.